Like them or not, having the Kardashians endorse your product or service would most likely be pretty good for your business, right? Well, today's guest did exactly that, getting millions of dollars of publicity along the way. And guess how much it cost her? $50,000? $500,000? $5 million? Nope. It cost her absolutely nothing. Let's find out how she did it on episode 453 of the award-winning small business big marketing show, thanks to Yellow and American Express. Well, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing madness. I'm your host, Timbo Reed, you, infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you're ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it absolutely deserves to be. Today's episode is made possible thanks to the good guys at Yellow who have a red hot range of digital marketing products designed specifically to help beautiful businesses just like yours get found. You can check them out at yellow.com.au. And we're also made possible thanks to American Express, whose business card programs can help optimize your cash flow and grow your business, and they offer an outstanding choice of rewards. What more do you want? Google Amex Business to find out more. Big show today. Oh, yes, indeed, Lee Doodly. XTV producer turned pajama entrepreneur Sophie Lovejoy joins us to explain how she got the world's most famous TV family to wear her pyjamas. And we revisit an old TV jingle that will have you saying, thank you very much, thank you very, 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 very much. (laughs) If you remember that, you're as old as I am. Plus, I've got some great news about upcoming guests. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Let's meet Adelaide-born, LA-based Sophie Lovejoy, who is the founder of the sophisticated sleepwear brand Sant and Abel. Now, as an ex-TV producer, Sophie is one of those go-getting, and I mean go-getting business owners, who makes things happen. Her biggest marketing claim to fame is she arranged to have every single Kardashian wear her pyjamas multiple times on their hit TV show, on their socials, apps, and blogs. And the exposure Sophie got is worth millions. And guess what? She didn't pay a cent. So if you don't like the Kardashians, that's okay. This is an episode in which you will learn how to get your product or service on the Kardashians, but it's about how to get serious celebrity endorsement, really, for your beautiful product or your beautiful service. So open your mind as you listen and don't be sitting there going, I don't want the Kardashians involved in my product. It's a nonsense show. Whatever. Put that aside. Now, as a naughty young schoolgirl, one of the things that Sophie did was teach her friends rude songs in the playground. So what better place to start than to ask Sophie, which was her favourite Little ditty. Oh my goodness. Well, it's actually, this is amazing that you brought this up. Um, Very timely, in fact, because uh, my very first day in year two, I uh, got on uh, on top of the school fort with a good friend of mine, and we had the entire prep school watching us, and we decided to do a very rude rendition of uh, We Will Rock You, uh, <laughs> taught by our older brothers. So oh. obviously when uh, Bohemian Rhapsody came out uh, in November last year, we were instant fans of yes. it, having uh, having done our own performance when we were seven years old. D- dare I ask, uh, and, you know, I can put any rating on this show I like. So, you know, we're free here, Soph. Dare I ask for a couple of lines from your version of We Will Rock You? <laughs> Uh, we started off going boom, boom, sh, boom, boom, sh, and then went, buddy, you're a man, you're a big fat man, and went through it and then said, sing it. 
We both started singing, we will, we will rock you, f*** you, oh, stick it right oh, up you. Oh, no, I knew that would happen. I knew that would happen. I'm sorry, iTunes. Hey, now, let's talk about much less serious stuff, <laughs> Miss Lovejoy. You're a t- you were a TV producer, right, before you got into this whole pyjama business. Absolutely, I was. And I was actually... Um, I did a stint working for 2020, which is part of the American broadcast, uh, over in New York. Oh, and uh, it was the most fantastic job, working with the likes of Barbara Walters and Diane Sawyer. Wow. And I, it was just, it kept me on my toes and it was very, very exciting. But when the global financial crisis happened, Disney, who owns ABC, they got rid of all foreigners unless they were at an executive level. So I had to come back to Australia. Um, And I worked in television back there, had a number of production jobs and was working for Channel 9, but I started to get itchy feet. Uh And then comes the small business idea. Before we talk about that, um, in fact, my next interview is with a fellow who just last week organised Elton John's Oscar after party. And we're going to be talking about managing difficult clients. I imagine someone like Barbara Walters, and you've worked with the Kardashians now, or at least their showrunner and producer. Um, What's your view on working with difficult clients in, in your business? It was funny because Barbara is obviously regarded as a uh, female pioneer in journalism, really. Um, And I think by the time I was there in 2006, 2007, uh, I actually didn't find her as inspiring as I would have hoped. I I sort of found her questions uh, in interviews quite shallow and basic. You're putting the pressure Um, on me now. How am I going? (laughs) Well, the fact that you launched with um, bringing up a rude song that I yes. sang in primary school, that is incredible research. There uh, you go. There you go. I've, I'm, I'm winning so go. far. Tr- you will trump uh, Barbara Walters. The, I, I didn't think that, didn't think that was possible, but I, I feel like I've ticked a box. Can we finish oh, now? And, absolutely. Um, hey, now you listen. So you, get, you get itchy feet. You, you've done your TV producer thing. You've lived the high life in New York. The itchy feet, is that about coming back home to Adelaide or is that about starting your own business? What What's that about? It was. I was actually working for Channel 9 in Sydney and as much as I loved it, I wasn't getting the mental stimulation. And it was around 2010 and, you know, not the mental stimulation that I was getting at 2020, for example, where we could really sink our teeth into these big investigations. Yep. Um, and I just wasn't getting that. And so... I was also very fascinated by the evolution of the e-commerce industry. Um, And my mum back in Adelaide has a big homeware store, Outdoors on Parade, which she's had for almost 40 years now. And uh, so I was back one weekend and I said to her, you know, I'm getting itchy feet and I want to do something on the side. I want to make something that I can sell online. And... um, we just started brainstorming ideas and she said, well, you know, we sell men's boxer shorts. It's kind of a small item in the whole scheme of her store. And she said, they've been bought out by bigger brands. The designs are no longer as good. And I said, right, well, on my production break, I'll head over to Bali because my brother had just moved over there to set up a restaurant. And I said, I know what you want. I'll go and get it made. And I thought that's an easy, lightweight thing to yeah. item to to be able to sell online with limited returns, and you know, because it's got such a flexible fit, and that that's how it started. But that's certainly not how it ended up launching. Hold that thought, then. I'm interested to know how it went. You just went through that so simply. Was, this is what you just said. So it's like, so I was back in Adelaide from a break in LA or wherever you were, and Mum needed some boxes, and my brother was in Bali, and I said, Mum, I can make those boxes in Bali. So I went over to Bali, and I had them made. Are you one of those chicks who just gets stuff done? <laughs> yes, I am. I am. I I just. If I put my mind to it, I'm like, well, there's no mucking around. Let's just do it. Um, I kind of throw myself into the deep end and then work out once I'm in there how to do it. Nice. Uh, and I kind of, I mean, I certainly do think about things before before I approach a situation. But I was like, 
yeah, I've got this, I can work it out and I'll enjoy the challenge of working it out. And that's sort of how I approach my entire business philosophy okay. the whole so, way along. So, because obviously, what you know, coming from a TV producing background, I didn't have, an, I didn't have a clue about manufacturing. So uh, I ended up uh, spending, I was going to go to Bali on my production break. What I actually did was I spent the entire summer in the Double Bay Library <laughs> researching not just boxer shorts, but the sleepwear industry in Australia, the US and the UK. And what I found was that there was a gap in the market for an attainable luxury uh, collection of pyjamas for the whole family. There were plenty of uh, pyjamas for women, very few for men and, uh, you know, a selection for kids, but no brand was really – Peter Alexander was obviously there – but I, I wanted to do it a couple of notches above him. And, and so then we, uh, we resumed production and I took three weeks off in March in 2011 and I went to Bali and that's when I threw myself into the deep end well and truly and had to find my own manufacturers. I, had to, I went off to a street here, uh, in Bali called Sulawesi in Denpasar mm-hmm. and it's very famous for its fabrics. And there I was just walking up and down this street, bargaining with all of these fabric sellers and saying, now, is this 100% cotton? And they'd say, yes, yes. So I'd take a swatch and I'd burn it. And sure enough, it was polyester. (laughs) And, you know, just, uh, I guess, learning the ropes and learning that I was going to have the wool pulled over my eyes very quickly because they could tell that that I was a novice. Mm -hmm. And... um, yeah, I had to become street smart very, very quickly. Did you at this point have uh, some financial backing? Did you have a bit of a runway? Hate that word, bit of a wanky word, but you know what I mean. Did, did you have some uh, some uh, space to kind of bring this to life without having to worry about where your next dollar was coming from? Uh, a little bit, because I mean, I was still working at uh, Channel Nine almost up until I moved to Los Angeles, so I had that part. Mm. Um, when I was 13, I had a I got a job at McDonald's because I wanted to buy Telstra shares. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I did build up a bit of a share portfolio, which I, over the time of running this business, I, I have sold. Um, but it has just been the most invaluable thing to have on my side when I've when I've needed um, a few extra Brilliant. dollars here and there. So, so you've, you've found your fabric, you've got your first design collection, you've had it manufactured in Bali, and what have you done? Gone and retailed, in, re- retailed it in mum's outdoors on parade store. That's correct. So I was only ever going to um, launch it uh, online and on my website and also um, uh, on my, uh, at mum's store. Um, and I ended up after, I mean, speaking of marketing, Mm. I, I basically, uh, took photos of my friends wearing them. This is, you know, the early days of Facebook. Um, they would, I'd tag my friends and, uh, the next thing, you know, it would appear in all of the, the news feeds and so on. And, and then I had 18 stores wanting to carry it within three months of launching. Because they saw you on Facebook? Because they saw it on Facebook, but not specifically through me. It was because I was, I got so many of my friends involved as my models. And so someone saw it from somewhere and then mm. they had a store or they knew of someone who had a store who could carry this product. And it snowballed like crazy beyond what I had ever anticipated. And so then... I found myself going off to the Willoughby Post Office at lunchtime when I was working at Channel 9 out at TCN and and I was sending off orders and then I was coming home and working on these orders for retail stores and this was in the lead up to Christmas so obviously it was going to be a really busy period and it's, it, it, that was never part of what I had anticipated. I just wanted a side business while I worked at Channel 9 or while I worked in television hoping to one day get back to, say, New York to work for 2020. 
Yes. So where was the tipping point so far you've gone, well, I'm going to have to make a hard decision here and either go... uh... That was in uh, 2012 and it just got to the point where I had two full-time jobs. Yes. And I just thought, I can't do this. I have got containers piled up in my bedroom, in my living room, uh, which, you know, in a flat that I shared with two other friends. It's like, my God, this this just isn't really... uh, life isn't sustainable. Yeah. How, how were you mentally at this stage? Were you excited? Were you on the verge of a breakdown? Were you, how were you feeling? <laughs> no, I, you know, I was so excited. And to this day, I still wake up pretty much every day excited about what's about to happen. You're, you're a glass half full kind of chick though. That's for sure. I can tell. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, obviously I have challenging days, yeah. and, but I still get excited because there's going to be something new that happens every day. And, you know, that's the whole reason why I started it because I wasn't getting, I wasn't being challenged, uh, in my other job. Tell me about your most challenging day. Oh, my most challenging day. You know, it's probably dealing with the manufacturers, uh, because there's always going to be a bit of a breakdown in communication. And I I started out manufacturing in Bali, number one, because my brother uh, lived there, so it was great to have him on the ground. Um, And also they have smaller quantities, uh, smaller minimums um, to start out with. Uh, And now I do a lot in China, a little bit in Bali and a little bit in L.A. Um, But there's always going to be a breakdown in communication, Mm -hmm. Uh, things will come back that you don't quite, you know, there'll be things missing or things that they where they just haven't followed the instructions. That pink flamingo set came back luminous green and it was like, yeah, it's not going to work. Oh, my goodness, yeah. I mean, there are times when I remember I had a uh, oh, I had a print that I sent out. This was in Bali and... Uh, I'd had strike-offs printed. So that's, you know, the fabric that Mm -hmm. you send them, the Pantone colours along with your print, along with the artwork. They do a strike-off on a swatch of fabric. And so that was all good to go. And then they, I gave them um, the green light and then they printed it for the bulk and it was red. Oh, Oh, (laughs) and I mean, you know, I ended up selling it, but, oh, there were... Uh, there would certainly arguments and, um, you know, no for sure, on Pardon. that side of it, it does become so stressful. So, uh, interested to know, were, when you made the decision, it sounds like both businesses were rocking. You, you're nailing your your work at Channel 9. It's, uh, Santa and Abel is taking off. Um, did you find, though, that when you left Channel 9, Santa and Abel went to a whole nother level because you were 100% focused on it? Yes, it did. But it was around that time because I, I was actually, I ended up freelancing for Channel 9, so that a bit of money was coming in did. still. Um, but it also gave me the flexibility to keep going back to Bali. Um, you know, it's obviously so close to Australia. So I, I was able to go back and forth quite often and keep an eye on things. And it was at that point I thought, well, I'm – technically running this business remotely every time I go to Bali, surely I can do it from LA. And so then that was my next thing. Mm. I was like, well, I I don't want to get too complacent here. I actually do want to be at the forefront of entrepreneurship in in America on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. Uh, So um, it, it really wasn't too long. It was... 2013, so two years after I launched it in Australia, that I packed up and moved everything over to Los Angeles. And by that point, I had a well-established warehouse in Australia, which was um, connected through uh, EDI to my website. So any orders that would come through, and obviously it's it's still like this to this day, but any orders that would come through would just go straight through to the warehouse. So that I, when I left Australia everything was as automated as it possibly could be. So if there wasn't a bloke in LA that you were kind of racing over to be with, was there? It was purely a business decision? (laughs) No, I went solo except that there were so many friends who all moved at the same time from predominantly from Melbourne. So just let um, me understand that. You, you, you've you already got an American connection. You were comfortable being over there. The, mm. the business is booming back in Australia, but you felt the need to go to LA because 
why it's the heart of entrepreneurship in America? So what? Um, I, you know, I did feel, and possibly this is this was from my time. I guess my exposure to the American market uh, when I lived in New York, I just felt like I was competing with say twenty four million versus three hundred and fifty million. Mm. Um, all of the, I'd, I'd say probably ninety percent of my expenses are in US dollars. Um, so I really, I, I moved over there for several reasons. So one to to go into a bigger market, uh, to be selling and and receiving US dollars, and obviously to be in this really exciting environment where there are just so many startups. Uh, and you know, and I wanted to be able to to be right in the mix of it all or in the thick of it all uh, and to then apply that back to the Australian company as much as the US company. Brave decision or was it? I know and I, I mean I can't even tell you the first couple of years were so, so hard. In what way were they hard, so? So there, you know, there were times, I, I've, I've got to say Americans are so enthusiastic about businesses and ideas and they put so much enthusiasm and energy behind them and I moved to LA and I'd say I've got this pajama company and they're like fantastic that is amazing and and I'd meet with buyers initially or I'd talk to them on the phone and they'd say oh I love it I love it come and meet me in my showroom and uh, or you know, uh, and a lot of the a lot of the fashion uh, is in you know a lot of the businesses are based in downtown mm-hmm. LA, and to get down there, that's sort of the real fashion hub. To get down there uh, often um, can take over an hour if you're stuck in peak hour traffic. So I I was unrelenting, and I would set up. I just kept calling and calling for meetings with with either showrooms or buyers. I can't even tell you how many times those meetings were cancelled oh, as I pulled up in the parking lot or I'd, I'd walk in and a junior assistant, junior buyer would say to me, oh, no, so-and-so has left for the day. Sorry, she can't meet with you. Here are your samples. What's, what's that about? Is that an American thing? Do they not stick to their appointments? <laughs> it's funny because I would talk to my uh, my Australian friends over there who – they're all over there trying to carve out some sort of very exciting career in mm. their own right. And we all have similar stories to this. Mm. And I do think that, um, and it's something that I really love about Australia and Australians, is that it's a lot more black and white. Yes. You're going to know pretty quickly where you stand. Uh, whereas we, we call it the slow no in America where... You kind of get told yes so many times and then eventually they say no. Uh, But, you know, another thing which I have come to realise, and I think this is applicable all over the world uh, in any business, but certainly in somewhere like uh, LA, is that you have to earn your stripes. And I was a new kid on the block with huge ambitions and, you know, you kind of need to develop a thick skin and I think that's all... It's all part of it. And after, say, 12 or 24 months, a lot of people pack up and go home because they find that it's too hard. And there's absolutely no way that I ever would. If you're struggling to get that beautiful business of yours found on the big black hole that is social media, then it would be a good idea to check out Yellow's social ads offer a rather sophisticated way to build your social profile and connect with prospects who are looking for what it is you're selling. They use fancy stuff like retargeting and machine learning to optimise your social spend. Don't go asking what all that means. That'd kind of be like asking your mechanic what the flux capacitor does in your car. All you need to know is that Yellow's social ads deliver results, not just likes. And as much as we all love to be liked, it's results that pay the bills. Find out more at yellow.com.au. Hey, I'm guessing your business has many, many needs. Maybe you need extended cash flow to bring to life that genius marketing idea that you've been sitting on for way too long. Or maybe... 
you'd love a rewards points program that had you flying at the pointy end of the plane on the trip of a lifetime. Maybe you're just like a business tool that made running that beautiful business of yours just that little bit easier. Well, here's what I'd do. After the show, check out American Express's range of business cards designed specifically to help small businesses like yours. Simply Google Amex Business to find out more. Now, back to the interview. Hey, we are, we are chatting with LA-based Sophie Lovejoy, the founder of fancy PJ brand Sant and Abel. So if you had the Beverly Hills breakthrough, as I'm going to call it, you became a frequent visitor to the Beverly Hills Hotel. What was that all about? So it's funny, when I moved to LA, one of my strategies was to break into the hotel and resort industry over there because I discovered that very few of them were selling pyjamas. And I thought that, to me, that's a no-brainer to sell beautiful pyjamas at these beautiful properties. And the Surely a lot of them have got the budget to do so. And I made the Beverly Hills Hotel one of my top priorities. And actually, um, you know, this is another example of just calling and calling and hitting hitting a brick wall. Then one day I went to, I was at, a, at an event in Sonoma up near the uh, Napa Valley. And I ended up sitting, I was at a dinner and there were a lot of people from the hotel and resort industry and I happened to be sitting next to the spa director of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Oh, hello! At this at this welcome dinner, I, I mean, talk about timing. It was quite amazing. And she said to me, "I actually uh, back in the office. I sit uh, sit next door to uh, sit next to James, the retail director at the time." So, if just at, at this point, are you keeping your cool, or are you just completely <laughs> exploding? Just try to, you know. <laughs> Everything's okay. Everything's I, I actually, I was very enthusiastic, but I was I was still keeping my cool yes. a little bit yes. because there were also other people, um, you know, at this event who who I also wanted to speak to, and and I always do have the philosophy of trying to keep as many eggs in as many baskets as possible, yes. um, because you just kind of one may drop off and you want to start to pursue another, so. I, I certainly was very excited, uh, but I did try and keep my cool a little bit. Yep. Um, but she said, I'll, I'll talk to James when I get back. A couple of months passed and I sent her a few follow-up emails. Then the next thing, out of the blue, I get an email from James saying, uh, I'd, love to, uh, I'd love for you to come in and show your collection. Can you come in tomorrow morning? Yes. And... I literally dropped everything and said, absolutely. So he picked up pieces from the core line and um, and I said to him, you know, it would be really great to do a customised collection in the banana leaf print, in the Martinique print, which lines the corridors uh, of the hotel. And he said that would be great, but I'm actually moving on. Um, he was moved on to the food and beverage department. How often does that happen? You find a great contact and start to do business and then they move on. That is so frustrating. Oh, it is so frustrating. And I, I am starting to find this with the department stores as well. Right. And there's a lot of mo- movement within the company. But I, I guess at least you've still got that contact, particularly if they stay within yes. the company. They're surely going to know a number of other people there. Um, and this new this new girl came in who actually took over both the, star, uh, the, the spa and the retail store and she was all for this idea. And then she got a bunch of her other vendors on board to do the same thing and to, to make products in the Martinique print. Wow. So you, you've all of a sudden, you found your way into the Beverly Hills Hotel. Now you're being stocked with some of your product plus you've got a dedicated bespoke design of their trademarked print. Mm-hmm. That must have gone nuts. It was pretty crazy. Um, we we had a launch party at in the, the cabana down by the pool. It was a brunch and we had a, a um, number of people, say from the Hollywood Reporter and Vogue and social media influencers, and we dressed them all up in the pyjamas. The photos were unbelievable. The press that came out from it was unbelievable. 
But I think the real tipping point with this whole collaboration was what happened with the Kardashians. Mm. So that is the next step, is it? Is that how... Because did they approach you or did you set some kind of wish list to say, who would I love to now wear this Martinique print uh, on the on the global stage? The PR company that I was working or that did all of the work for me, uh, they said, if you were to offer this as an exclusive, who who would get it? And I said the Kardashians, because I already knew uh, the editor, Jen, the editor of their apps. And I think their apps have now closed down because they're all kind of moving into different directions with their businesses. But at the time, their apps were quite a big thing. And uh, Jen was already a big fan of the pyjamas and she had them for herself and her kids. And I said the Kardashians would be number one. And I didn't even really watch the show. I didn't even know all of their names, embarrassingly, at the time. Uh, But I said, I want them to have it. And they basically said to me, you're dreaming. And I said, no, go to Jen and offer it to her as an exclusive and see what she says. And so the next thing, I was walking along with a friend and I get this email saying, Jen has pitched it to the girls and Courtney loves the idea and she would love to run it as an exclusive on her app. And she did. What does that mean? She wants to run it as an exclusive on her app. What does that mean? What does it look so, like? So, so I guess to be the very first, um, first person to uh, cover the whole collection and the story uh. behind it and so on um, and, you know, with photos of, her wearing them and uh, at the hotel, and yeah, to be the first one to do it, I and I guess certainly the first blog to do it. And so Courtney puts her hand up, says she wants to cover it. What do you do then? You get this phone call. Who you clearly then dropped everything again. You're dropping things often, so you know, <laughs> like, all for good reason. Sure, yeah, I have to be on my toes. Everything is fairly uh, spontaneous. I, I imagine that then requires some instant action on your behalf because it's not like she wants to cover it in four weeks' time. It's probably four hours' time, is it, or something ridiculous? Well, fortunately, from that perspective, initially they only – they only wanted photos. So that part was okay. And she ended up putting together this full story and only put a photo of herself and her kids um, sitting in the polo lounge, but they weren't wearing the collection, but they were basically just saying we're fans of of this collaboration. Mm-hmm. We grew up going to this hotel. And, and then they gave this full spiel about, uh, or she gave a full spiel about Santa Nabel being from Sydney and moving to L.A., I mean, it was amazing, but then that came out on a Wednesday. Then two days later, I get an email from the senior producer of Keeping Up With The Kardashians saying, we saw Courtney's blog and uh, we would like these particular pieces sent over to us in the next hour. <laughs> and and he, the, uh, the senior producer said, we're, uh, we're filming in Calabasas this afternoon. And I was like, I didn't even... So they wanted the short sleeve <laughs> shirt and boxer short set. I didn't even have those samples on me. I said, all I've got are the night shirts and the eye masks. And he said, done. Uh, we're sending a runner over to your place. And literally within about 45 minutes, there was a runner knocking on my door with a full headset, walkie-talkie, everything. Classy. And... It was just this quick exchange of the products and and then she left. And I, what happened that afternoon was absolutely crazy. I actually went out for dinner and my phone was blowing up. I, I had so many friends saying, oh, my God, have a look at this screenshot after screenshot. And they were all put, uh, they were posting photos of themselves in the night shirts, having pillow fights and so uh, doing these crazy Snapchats in front uh, in front of their mirrors, and I mean I'm hopeless with Snapchat, and so I couldn't even keep up with any of this. I I just I was in complete shock that all of this had happened from about 11 a.m. that morning, and then it literally blew up. But then six weeks later, 
the episode went to air and I thought, oh, well, it's only going to be just uh, 30 seconds or something. It was about a seven-minute segment. Of the, of the Kardashians wearing your product on the highest rating reality TV show in the world. I, I don't know. Could you put a dollar value to that? I, I don't even know. I, all I know is that people do spend over a million dollars to get their products on their TV shows. So I – and I literally didn't have to really pay a cent except for the, the cost of those samples. It, it was jaw-dropping, really. I, I could not believe it. What, what then uh, happened to sales? Did your website crash? Did you sell out of everything? Did, what happened? Now, this, this was, um, you know, certainly every collaboration that, that I do, it's always a learning experience. But uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel had it exclusively. So I couldn't sell it on my website. Ah. And my God, I wish I had have negotiated mm. that, you know, more thoroughly at the time. But I think I was just so excited and felt so fortunate to be in there that I didn't want to push it. And I think now if I have my time again doing something, well, I mean, I have and I certainly have negotiated with other, um, with other partnerships. Uh, but to do this exact one all over again, if I could turn back time, I would have, um, I would have renegotiated that because unfortunately they did not have, uh, they kind of, ran it on more of a manual sales system and a manual stock take and the night shirts sold out almost immediately but they weren't really keeping track of sales the way that I would have liked. So if I imagine though that there would have been a run on effect back to your website where people are now the brand is now you know front and center in terms of PJs. The traffic that I ended up getting back to my website was unbelievable and I mm. still have that because it was a limited edition collection. We still get inundated pretty much every single week for, uh, from people asking for that specific collection. What's the learning? For the small business owner listening here, help me pull out the learning, Soph, because you've gone, you, you've gone hard. You man, It takes, a, you know, what do they say, 10 years to be an overnight success. So this didn't, just, didn't just happen, you know, like mm. you put a lot of effort into getting there. But getting, you know, your product in the hands of major influencers, what's your, what's your big tip there? Oh, gosh. I, I mean, I, I feel like i constantly learning about, you know, uh, the way that I should approach this. I mean, it really took me three. I arrived in 2013. It wasn't until 2016 that I got this partnership. So that was three years of really, really pushing it. Mm. Um, but then once I got it, I was like, I you know, I just had this gut feeling that it was going to be a great success. And so, like I was saying before, when when my PR company said, who do you want to give this to as an exclusive? Absolutely aim for the top because the worst that they're ever going to say is no. Um, and, you know, I know that things are constantly evol uh, evolving with social media influences and, their demands and, you know, that mm. they want X thousand dollars for a post. I have never paid for a single post ever and I don't intend to, not at this point. I, I've given out products and but I will never pay, uh, I just won't pay for a post. Do you, do you think I'll, the world's moved on from that? I mean, that was a bit of a, a moment in time where, you know, Social influencers were getting paid good money for posts. Uh, are you are you guys now getting a bit smarter about that? Well, see, after after the Beverly Hills Hotel collab, we were then approached by Kiara Ferragni. Are you familiar with her from nope. Milan? Nope. Uh, she's she's got the blonde salad. She's got, uh, I think, I don't know the the latest count about twenty million followers. Uh, she she used to stay at the Beverly Hills Hotel often um, and her team contacted me about doing a collaboration for her website, which we did, and that was also a huge success. Mm -hmm. um, but I started to have a number of people under my belt, like the Kardashians and Kiara and a few others. And so then every time I got contacted about, um, you know, about 
sending product, then I'd these influencers would then say, well, here's my media kit. Uh, it's going to be $10,000 for one post. And I'd sort of laugh it off. I mean, that's not in my marketing budget no. whatsoever. I'm still a small company and there's no guaranteed ROI with these things. Mm. So I, I would always turn around and I said, look, we're very happy to give you product to wear uh, so long as you tag us and you do this and that. But, you know, we've had the likes of the Kardashians and Kiara doing it for free. And, you know, they're much, much, much bigger influencers. <laughs> what a great thing to be able to say. Oh, Th- 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 Thanks for the opportunity. But, look, we've had the Kardashians wear our stuff and uh, <laughs> yeah. we're doing okay. So, you know, if you wanted, um, if you want to be part of it, absolutely. We'll, we'll send you some pyjamas, but we're just not going to pay for the post. Did you ever meet any of the Kardashians? No, uh, I never have, but I, I talk to Courtney's manager quite often. Do you Did you send them something? That, I mean, what do you send the Kardashians by way of thank you? I just, in fact, coming in to the studio today, I just heard on the news, Kylie Jenner is mm. the first, is the youngest billionaire ever. She billionaire. 21 it's, and she is now a billionaire. It blows my mind. <laughs> good, good on her. Did you send the thank you card or a bunch oh, of flowers? Yes, I did. But now every, I mean, every Christmas I send them some pajamas. I did a partnership with a big Los Angeles artist last year, um, uh, which launched in October, and I actually, Courtney's the one who I, um, who seems to really support Santa Nable in a big way. So I sent her a big uh, package for her family. And she put it on her app again as her favourite picks for Christmas. Beautiful. And uh, and then there are posts that pop up every now and then of her kids wearing uh, wearing the Christmas sets. That's Still, what we want. hey, yeah, a couple of quick questions before we wrap up, Soph. Um, I, I meant to ask you the name Sant and Abel. Do you know it means absolutely nothing? <laughs> I wanted I wanted a name that would become entirely synonymous with my pyjamas. Uh, I was initially going to call it Sable and Ant, named after the Sable Antelope in Africa, the most handsome antelope in Africa. <laughs> and bizarrely, my cousin, who's an IP lawyer, did all of the work and he said, in the apparel category, there are two Sables and there's even a Sable and Argent. Right you on. can't use it. I had all of these tags and labels and things made up that had said that said SNA. I was like, well... And that's particularly when every single cent was precious to me. Yes. And I said, well, what am I meant to do? But as he was talking, he kept saying Sant and Abel by accident. This is right, uh, that's it. muddling the words up. It works. And it, stuck. it means nothing, but it works. Tell me, uh, are you likely to uh, open a bricks and mortar store? Is it always going to be an online business and a wholesaling business? It's That is a very good question. It's well, something that I think about often but I just have to have uh, the right approach I love the model that um, uh, businesses like Warby Parker and Bonobos have uh, where they just have one they just have small stores but they have one item of everything and then they get everything out to you within two days Uh, I think that's very clever um, yeah, I, I think about it. It's, it's not out of the question, um, but I think there are other things that I want to do before I'd consider that. And so technology in PJs, are we, is it likely, are we likely to see anything? Sleep monitors, <gasps> essential oils um, releasing oh throughout gosh, the night? What actually, do we got? It's, it's amazing. I know that Under Armour have been experimenting with it, ah. uh, and it would be great to incorporate something like, um, the heart rate and, you know, uh, I guess everything that the Fitbit already does. I've got an idea Uh, for you, Soph. I was talking to my acupuncturist only this week. Now, mm -hmm. I I tend to sleep on my front, which is not good. You're not meant to sleep on your front. Don't know whether you knew that, but it's... I do that a bit myself. Right, it's a no-no. And he is suggesting uh, via his chiropractor, he got this idea from, you... I, you sew soft animals onto the front of your pajamas, Ooh. And, and it stops you from sleeping on your front. You're forced to sleep on your side or your back. So you can have that one for free. Oh, I, thank you, yes. Tim. 
Thank you very much. I'll be sure to uh, attribute you when it. If you could call the on shelf. the Timbos, I'd really appreciate yeah. that. And as Timbos, long as they're, uh, it's got such a good ring to it. it thank you. Uh, sort of pink and fluffy. I'm looking for. That's the that's the style. I'm sort of feeling. <laughs> Hey, Soph, great story. Ripper story. Um, Thank you so much. You know, I've loved this. I know. The, you, you thought, where can you go? You've been on the Kardashians. Well, you're on the Small <laughs> Business Big Marketing Show. So love your work. If people want to buy some Sant and Abel, they can, whether they're in America or Australia, Sant and Abel, A-B-E-L dot com is where to go. Sophie, love joy. Love your work. Thanks, Timbo. Well, there you go, team. Founder of fancy PJ brand, Sant and Abel. Sophie Lovejoy, what a great lady. Inspiring, as many of my guests are. Hey, you'll find links and pics of Sophie's Kardashian win in the show notes over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 453. And by the way, Sophie has very, very kindly donated 15 $50 vouchers for me to give away throughout this year in the Monster Prize draw for you to get a new set of PJs. So be sure to enter the Monster Prize draw. You've heard me talk about it. I would love to hear from you. Be sure to hang around after my top three attention grabbers as we revisit a great old jingle from 1983. But first, thanks to Yellow and American Express, here's what grabbed my attention from our chat with Sophie. Attention grabber number one. I love Sophie's quote about jump in the deep end, then work it out. We've talked about this before. You know I'm not a much of a planning kind of guy. I just kind of go for it, work it out afterwards. Seems to work. But uh, it has worked for Sophie. It worked for so many of my past guests. And I have to say that, you know, taking the risk, jumping, and then building the parachute on the way down seems to be a good strategy for some. Attention grabber number two. I love how Sophie chose to move to LA to access a bigger market a more exciting business environment, and earn some US dollars for your greenbacks along the way. I love that. It kind of raises the question, where could you move your business to to do those kinds of things? Or are you happy where you are? Attention grabber number three, I love Sophie's enthusiasm towards networking, starting with her being a regular at the Beverly Hills Hilton. Probably a nice place to be a regular, but she really is enthusiastic about networking, about connecting with the right people, and she seems to do it very well. If you are a bit of a networker, but it's not working for you, maybe you know make a slight pivot as to how you approach it. Less push, more pull, less tell, more tell, I should say, less sell, all that kind of stuff. But Sophie is a great networker. That's what grabbed my attention. Love to know what grabbed your attention. Or maybe you just want to share the show around. I'd love you to sort of go onto the show notes and to share it on your Facebook or your Twitter or your Insta. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com forward slash 453 is where you would do that. Right, oh team, we haven't had a jingle of the week for a while. And I do like this segment. It's one of those segments that's sort of catchy, like a good jingle should be. So let's hop back into the advertising time machine and venture back to 1983 when TV advertising campaigns ran into the millions of dollars and every second brand had a catchy jingle to sell its wares. This one's for Rose's Chocolates. And I've got to apologise right up front as it will most likely stay in your head for at least a week. It's been in my head for the entire weekend since I found it last Friday, which was three days ago. Unless you have some insanely effective meditation practice that enables you to avoid that kind of thing happening, I I think it will kind of stay in your head. I apologise again. All right, here's the jingle. Thank you very much for the care, we're grateful. Thank you very much, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much for being so helpful. Thank you very much, very much. Say thank you with Cadbury Roses Chocolates. Whatever the occasion, or for any reason at all, lots of delicious centres covered in smooth Cadbury chocolate. Thank you very much for doing the dishes. Thank you very much, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you very much just for being my missus. Thank you very, 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 very much. See, I told you. Thank you, thank you very, 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 very much. It's going to be in your head for a very long time to come. Well, that almost wraps up episode 453 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show, sponsored by Yellow and American Express. Be sure to search Amex Business to find out how your business expenses can reward you, because they can. And check out yellow.com.au if you're keen for your business to get found in that big black hole called social media. 
Next week, we catch up with customer experience expert Amanda Stevens for a far-reaching chat and quite a fun chat on the state of small business marketing generally. And I'm very excited to say we've secured an interview with the fellow who brought tradies underwear to the men of Australia and the women of Australia as well. He's kind of, that's an incredible story. He's kind of, it's a household name within like a couple of years. We'll find out how he did it. Don't forget there's an entire back catalogue of interviews over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you love the Small Business Big Marketing Show, then let another business owner know about it by grabbing their phone and downloading it for them into their podcast app. Maybe you even need to give them a little bit of education around what is a podcast. Until next week, I'm Timbo Reid. You're not. Thanks for tuning in. May your marketing be the best marketing. Bye for now.